Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, in today's video, I wanted to go over uh, my latest build, my latest creation um, that I have here. Uh, this is my 12.5 SBR that I built up, um, made up of many different components. Before I get into uh, each individual part on here, um, just a little brief overview. When I decided to build this up, I knew that um, I wanted to build a 12.5. Uh, I don't know if it's just a fad or if it's something that's well established now, but I think 12.5 has definitely been um, found to be, or at least widely thought to be, like the perfect do-all AR barrel length. Well, I think a lot of people would um, generally think of a 12.5 um, when you think of that barrel, you may think of it closer to being like a Mark 18. You know, the Mark 18 has got a 10.3 inch barrel. Um, definitely has served its purpose in uh, conflicts over the years. Um, but believe it or not, uh, there is quite a bit of terminal ballistic difference in between a 10.3, uh, even up going up to 11.5 and just going one, one inch more to 12.5. There's pretty big jumps in velocity in between each barrel length. Uh, and, and believe it or not, there's really zero uh, terminal ballistic or velocity difference between a 12.5 going up to a 14.5. Um, you don't see another jump until you move up to about 16 inches. So with a 12.5 barrel, 12.5 um, inch barrel, you are getting, uh, I, I, want, I believe it's about 2,850 feet per second coming out of the muzzle. Um, it, it, and it holds that velocity a lot better than a Mark 18. And you are not losing... Um, is much handiness for a rifle and in comparison uh, I will go to uh, my Mark 18 that I have you see here again 10.3 inch barrel uh, got both stocks fully collapsed laying it end to end it's kind of hard to see on camera um, as you see the 12.5 they got it lined up it's not much longer than the 10.3 whatsoever. So you do definitely maintain that compactness and the handiness without giving up uh, or gaining lots of uh, velocity over the 10.3. And then also another reason why I chose 12.5 is because already having the 10.3, I also have a 13.9, uh, a 14.5, and a 16. So I uh, figured that 12.5 would be a nice little bridge in between the 10, uh, the 10.3 and the uh, 13.9. So the thing that really kicked this build off was uh, my ability. And before uh, before I get started, we show the camera that the uh, magazine is empty, chamber is empty. So the thing that really kicked this build off was uh, getting my hands on this uh, LMT Mars L lower receiver. Uh, if you're not familiar with the LMT Mars L, it does have ambidextrous controls on it. So you see, it looks like a standard lower, um, but you do have a right side bolt catch, which really comes in handy for right handies, right handers, uh, if you want to lock the bolt back. But then also for lefties, as you go to insert a magazine, you can hit the bolt release, uh, and it drops the bolt. Um, furthermore, on the other side of the gun. Uh, there is a left side magazine release. So again, I am left-handed. So being able to reach over and hit the mag release, um, it's, a, it's a big benefit for people who are left-handed. So getting my hands on the lower receiver is what really kicked off this build. Um, and I knew that once I had had the thought to go ahead and let's, let's get the ball started on this build, um, the next choice was going to be the barrel. Um, you know, the most probably most important thing that you can choose in building an AR um, if you want the most accuracy is is going to be the barrel. That's really the soul of the of, of, of an AR. Um, and I wanted to get my hands on a Criterion Core. Um, awesome, awesome barrel. Uh, definitely hard to find brand new. I think they have a six to eight month lead time. Fortunately for me, I was able to find this one that was brand new on AR15.com's equipment exchange. Um, so... Had the barrel, got the lower receiver, and then I uh, was trying to decide on which upper receiver I wanted to go with. I did want to go with uh, more premium parts on this build. I didn't want to do anything that was going to be um, settling for things, at least when it came to the build itself, the main components of the build. Um, so I was looking at the Colt uh, stripped upper receivers on sale at Midway. I think they were like 130 
Um, and then I figured, well, if I got an LMT lower, uh, let me go ahead and get an LMT uh, stripped upper. So it wasn't 100% stripped. It did have, I guess they call them assembled uppers. Did have the Ford Assist already installed um, along with the ejection port covers. You see this one's uh, a Ford Controls design, which I'll get into later. Um, and also, this would be the first gun, the first AR that I have built up 100% um, on my own. Uh, I built up a couple lowers, you know, lowers are really simple. Um, I've bought complete uppers and changed components around on them, but I have never set a barrel. I've never set a gas block, installed a gas tube, um, installed a handguard. That's pretty basic stuff, especially a handguard. It's super simple, but, um, this would be a first all up build. And, you know, when they say, since I didn't install the forward assist, um, and the ejection port cover, uh, that it was not a complete build, but those are such simple installations. I think you can give me some credit on that one. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go from the muzzle to the buttstock and just go over each point uh, or each component and why I chose that. Uh, once I had the barrel set, once I had the lower receiver and the upper receiver, um, it was time to start choosing what I was going to use um, for the rest of the gun. So starting with the muzzle. Um, you know, I, I, I do have a Huxworks HXQD556. It's still currently in jail. I think I'm around 180 days or something like that now. So um, for me, flash hiding properties are a lot more important on a, when it comes to an AR than a muzzle brake, especially on a short little barrel like this. Uh, muzzle brakes are just absolutely obnoxious. So definitely went with the flash, hidey, flash hiding suppressor mount. Um, moving on to the gas block. Um, you know, lots of good gas blocks available out there. Uh, when I was trying to decide which one that I was going to get, um, went to uh, Criterion's website, and when they have the barrels, when you can buy them, um, they give you the option of buying a gas block, and the option or their offering is the Badger Ordnance TDX. So I figured, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and get that same gas block. Uh, that's the one that Criterion offers with their barrels. Let me just go ahead and stick with uh, what they what they have to offer, or what they suggest. Moving on to the handguard, um, originally uh, I, I was looking at getting a quad for this. Um, I only have one quad rail. Of all the guns I have between my Galil, the AKV, uh, my Tavor SAR, they all have M lock on it. I do really love a good quad rail. Um, there's not a lot of offerings out there for an 11 and a half inch quad rail and I really did not want to go with uh, chopping the flooring myself something I may do in the future uh, but for this one here considering I never built up an AR before that was one aspect that I didn't want to have to deal with uh, definitely wanted to get an 11 and a half I don't you know when you're looking for clearance on your suppressor mount um, I want to say that three quarter inches is about the minimum you really want to go. I know that that's what I have on my Mark 18, and I still had to install two thick shims underneath the uh, suppressor mount down there in order to get clearance. Um, so with this 12 and a half inch barrel, and um, even though this is just a blast for me, it has the same dimensions as the um, suppressor itself. Uh, so as you see there, a uh, little bit of gap, um, not, not horrible, definitely not as bad as my 13.9 that has a 12 inch handguard on it. Um, so uh, wanting to get a quad for it, there wasn't a ton of options, like I said, in the 11 and a half inch range. Um, I know that forward control design, uh, they have, I believe it's the RHF4 is their quad. Um, they did not have any that were in stock. I had reached out to them and they said that, uh, they said that sometime 2023 is when they'd be getting them back. So definitely don't have the patience for that. Um, so I was able to get my hands onto um, the RHF M-Lock version, uh, RHF 11.5, a very solid handguard. Um, picked this one up from Primary Arms. Uh, so once I nailed that one down, hit the buy button and pick that up. Um, weapon light. Uh, initially, you know, most of my guns, I, I, I go with mod light. Uh, I like mod light because um, besides their, their illumination properties, uh, they are more modular where you can use different surefire tail caps. Um, and then you have your choices from switches. So you could use a mod button light, you use a hot button, um, anything that takes a surefire plug. Uh, one thing that I did not ever have or get to see in person was the Cloud Defensive Rain uh, Generation 2.0. Uh, I have a 1.0 on my uh, IWI Zion 15. 
Um, the Rain 2.0 uh, offers quite a bit more output uh, on the Gen 2. They redesigned the switch a little bit, made it a little bit slimmer. Um, so on MidwestOptics.com, they had a deal where you could get the light, the Rain Gen 2 for, I want to say it was like 337 after shipping and taxes. So that's definitely going to be a lot cheaper than buying a mod light. Uh, then buying a tail cap and then buying a, you know, whether it would probably be a hot button. Um, so I, I could pick this up. Uh, I have definitely been very happy with it. It is um, a lot smaller than the Gen 1. I know that's one of the, some of the complaints about that one is that they're so big and bulky. Um, you know, side by side with the Mod Light, which I'll, show, I'll bring back out here. My Mark 18. You can see comparative wise. It's it's a little bit smaller even than the mod mod uh, mod light with the one eight six fifty body on it. Um, I do always choose uh, one eight six fifty bodies even on the shorter guns uh, because you get the the runtime on them is, is just so much longer. I mean, you pull usually about let's say it's about an hour and a half with the one eight six fifties. Uh, when you go with the shorter bodies and utilize the 18350 batteries, you're only going to be pulling probably about 35, 40 minutes tops. So for a front sight, um, I did go with the KAC 99051. Um, as you see, I do have this mounted backwards in order to free up rail space on the shorter handguard. Um, I think the 99051s pretty much speak for themselves. Definitely battle tested. Uh, great, great irons. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. So for a hand stop. This here is the Rail Scales LDAG. Um, I just got this actually, and it is replacing a, originally I had on here a Knight's Armament um, VFG that was chopped down, so it's a little stubby version. I'm not a fan of the longer full-size vertical foregrips on these shorter guns, really on any of my guns. I, I just, it just doesn't really look right to me. Um, so start off the KC, um, they do make this, well, this is the LDAG. I want to say it's the Anchor that looks exactly like this, except it's an M-Lock version, but they are, like, never in stock. This one was actually a blem uh, that I happened to get a tip on on social media in one of the gun groups. Um, and it is attached with the uh, Arasaka low-profile Picatinny um, M-Lock section. And as you can see, it does really sit it down a lot closer to the rail. Uh, that's what's great with these um, low-profile mounts from Picatinny. I'm sorry, from Arasaka. <clears throat> Though I will say, it doesn't work with everything. I know I tried using one with a Tango Down vertical grip, um, and there's not enough clearance. I had to use a standard uh, height, standard profile uh, Picatinny section. Uh, moving on to the sling mount, uh, Arasaka is always my go-to. When it comes to QD sling mounts, um, definitely there's plenty of other good versions out there. Um, these ones, I want to say they run about $30. They're not exactly cheap, uh, but I do like them because the screws uh, sit flush. I think one of the other ones I was looking at was the Bravo Company, but the Bravo Company used capped head screws instead of, um, instead of flush head screws. So for the upper receiver, like I mentioned, um, I got the LMT assembled upper. And one thing to note, it's like for LMT, I know that this mismatch in the forging, a lot of people see this on social media and, and you know, they talk about, you know, how, that would drive me crazy. It doesn't really bother me, um, but it is kind of funny how you get an upper and a lower from the same manufacturer. And uh, it is mismatched that much, especially from a company like LMT. You may also notice that the finish is completely different. Now, it looked a lot worse when I first got it when the upper was completely bone dry. I mean, this looked black and this looked like it was like a medium gray. So <clears throat> just something to take note of if, if you ever buy LMT upper receivers. Um, moving on, charging handle. Charging handle is a Geisley ACH. It is actually one of the Count Blemula models. Uh, went with this one when I typically go with Radiant Raptors. Uh, just because like the deal that I got on it um, again got on ar15.com's equipment exchange brand new um, between the charging handle and the Geisley uh, receiver extension which is a carbine length receiver extension um, I think I got both of them for like a hundred bucks so that's a pretty pretty dang good deal um, going to the uh, end plate here I know I'm skipping over some of the optics, but I'll get into that last. Uh, going to the end plate, I do always like to choose the um, QD end plates on here. Um, I was, being a big fan of forward control design, I was looking at their end plates. And it was just one of those things where 
I just couldn't see spending the money on it. I want to say that theirs were like 45 bucks, whereas the BCM um, was like $17, which is the same one I used on my 13.9 build. Uh, so that was one where I went, um, I just went ahead and went the cheaper route on there. Um, uh, Castle Nut. So the Castle Nut is the four controls design. Um, what's a little bit different on this one is that the slots here in the Castle Nut for staking, um, there are four of them. Whereas the standard military spec one had only has three. So once you get this thing torqued down to proper um, proper torque, uh, you have three places of which you can do staking. Is that overkill? Um, you know, maybe. Um, I don't know, especially if you stake it, period, or stake it correctly with just two. Do they still break loose? Eh, I don't know. But again, not, not a very expensive part and just gives you a little bit of extra peace of mind. And then going with the buttstock, originally what I had slated for uh, this gun was a Volter um, iMod. I really kind of would like the way that it looked. Uh, but the reason why I went with the B5 SOT mod was because you inside the uh, pad here, when you pop this thing off, there's a little tool that you can get um, that fits in a shadowed spot in the rubber butt pad. And part of that is for a, um, has a half inch wrench. So... If it needed to, in a jam, um, I could loosen the scope um, in order to get that off the gun and use the iron sights. So, moving on to the optics, <clears throat> the you see here I have the Vortex Razor um, Gen 2E 1 to 6. Uh, definitely knew I wanted to go LPV on this. I know in my previous videos, you know, I originally started off with the Viper for this, and I thought it just really wasn't suiting with the overall package. I went ahead and got the Razor. Move the Viper over to my 1522, um, and I wanted it to do a uh, piggyback mount with the micro red dot sight. Um, when I came to go choose the scope mount, um, when I was looking around and being newer to LBVOs, I didn't really know what's good and what's not. Um, and I came across again on the equipment exchange a guy selling a Knight's Armament unit that have scope caps. Now these ones are the standard ones that come with it, they're smooth. They offer a kit where it's got uh, attachments or screws, threaded screw holes uh, right in the middle and a little bit offset on each side in order for you to mount a springboard to mount a micro red dot sight. So <clears throat> you had the whole setup uh, for a really good price uh, and it was with a 193 mount. Uh, really kind of debated on whether I wanted to go 193 on this one, but I figured, you know, for, for closer in distances and the shooting that I'd be doing with it that a more heads-up position would be better so considering the price considering the availability and how it came with everything not just the scope mount which these things are really expensive as they are like almost any quality LPVO 30 mount 30 millimeter mount you know they're they're a couple hundred bucks um, they are definitely not cheap and I mean, you can buy cheap ones but you you know when it comes to your optics it, settling for a, a cheap mount with a good optic that, that that's your weak point so no kc definitely makes quality stuff i am happy with the height at 1.93 but i did find out that once i mounted the red up up top um it was way too high way way too high i don't have nods so i won't ever need to use any kind of passive aiming um and what i originally started with on this gun was a um holoson 509t um definitely wanted to do close emitter on this um got that one used but like new again on the ee um so once i figured out that this was going to be just a bit too high um i decided to go ahead and get the arisaka offset mount um these mounts are great because for one arisaka definitely makes quality stuff um but one of the things that they can do with this mount is you can mount this not just at 45 where it really hangs out there like a chicken wing, but you can just turn the base around and it, mounts, it pulls it in a little tighter and mounts it at 35 degrees. So that's the reason I went with that mount. And again, I know Airsocket definitely makes quality stuff. Um, but as you see, this is not a Hollow Sun 509T. Um, was able to get my hands on an Aimpoint Acro P2. And again, with the overall uh, build package of this gun, uh, I thought that was a little bit more suited for... Um, the Acro is more suited for this, so I went ahead and picked that one up instead. Um, really great optic, dot is crystal, super crisp, um, and I like the optic setup overall. Um, you know, I've, I've never had an offset before, but and, you know, I do have a um, TA31A car with an RMR that's piggybacked, and I always figured that that would be my preference, but once I tried this one out, 
Um, I do really like it. It is really quick. Um, really, really, really dig a lot. And then for the rear iron sight, uh, I did go with the Knight's Armament Micro 600 meter sight. I know that with <clears throat> having, it's, it really is overkill, having the LPVO or an optic that has etched glass, along with having an offset red dot that's on a Brock stable mount, along with being, um, you know, a, a super dependable red dot. Um, it's, it's really redundant to have iron sights on it, but uh, that's, that's just me. Plus, I really didn't like the way that it looks without iron sights. Um, so I had them, went ahead and put them on there. Uh, getting into the ejection port cover, um, as I mentioned, it, it did come with one installed from LMT, but I am definitely a fan of the four control design EPCs. Uh, it's just something a little bit different and pretty cool. Uh, this is the single dimple. Um, I did recently be able to get my hands on a uh, twin dimple. Um, that's coming from AR15discounts.com. Once that gets in here, I'll swap this one out and put this on something different. Um, for bolt carrier group, while the barrel may be the sole of an AR-15, your bolt carrier group is definitely the heartbeat. That's one of the areas that you want to, don't want to go cheap on. Um, wasn't quite willing to pay uh, LMT enhanced bolt money or KEC sand cutter money, uh, but I definitely wanted a good one. Originally, I did have a Psyonix phosphate colored one. Uh, I, I, I'm really good with phosphate uh, colored ones, but the Psyonix MP3s are super slick. Um, the coating on them stays a lot better than the nickel boron ones. Um, and the, the, the lubrication properties allegedly are a lot better. So I uh, started off with the phosphate. was able to get my hands on um, one of the blems, uh, which is like one little mark on the rail, a little nick mark. But that's really all that I can find on it. Um, so just recently swapped this out as well. I'm going to go ahead and use the Psyonix phosphate one in an 18-inch build that I'm going to be working on. So... Um, safety switch. So safety switch here, uh, LMT, it comes with the ambi safety on there or with the Marzel. Um, I do like the shorter throw safeties on it. Uh, I did have a um, Radian Raptor that I put in here. And for the trigger, I went with the Geisley SSAE. Um, though I do think I'm go going to end up putting in an SSP and move the SSAE over to um, the 18 inch build that I'm working on. But uh, I, I thought something was wrong with the trigger because I put everything together and when you went to go pull it, um, there was a very slight delay between pressing the trigger and when the hammer would actually drop. It was almost imperceptible. I didn't know if it was just me, but I do have an SSAE in another AR and it definitely was not the same. Plus, one of the things I could tell was that the pull weight was different every single time. So um, went out there on the web forums and asked some questions about it. And luckily somebody came back and said, hey, you know, I have a, it's probably your safety. Um, I had the same issue with my SSAE. And, you know, they said, you know, when you put it in the fire position, really put some tension on it and see if that solves the problem. So I did that and it did. And I said, man, that's crazy. So um, I put the LMT OEM safety switch back in there and it was fine. So I guess in some way, the back of the trigger um, interfaces with the, the, the safety switch and it causes it to slow down a little bit. Don't really understand that one, but it was. So um, I do prefer having the short throw safeties. Uh, this, is, this one here is the Badger Ordnance uh, Modular Safety. I think it's the Condition 1 Modular Safety. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and give that a shot because I've never messed with them. Um, it does come with a long throw lever, uh, a short throw lever, um, and I believe also there's, you can have it so there's no throw lever on your opposite hand. So wanted to give that one a shot. Do really like it and best it off, it did not interfere with the trigger. Um, as far as the grip goes, uh, this is the B5P22. And I'm sure most people are familiar with the P23s. I did not know they even made the P22s. I don't know if they just came out. And the difference between them is that it's a little bit more vertical. Uh, the original grip that I bought for this was the Reptilia CQC which is a little bit shorter. It did feel really good in the hand. Um, did, while I didn't have any complaints with it, uh, I did happen to see the MK machining slash driven arms um, grip, which is really more vertical. I really liked the way that one looked, so I picked that one up for it. Uh, problem that I had with that grip was that um, it's just too, it's, it's, you have to have some giant mitts for it. I, it just really wasn't super comfortable, comfortable for me on a uh, scoped, 
uh, gun, so I went ahead and replaced that with the P22. Um, trigger guard did originally have the LMT enhanced on there, and I think it was really that MK machining uh, grip on there that had more vertical on it, kind of pulls your, your finger up, but the LMT enhanced leaves this gap open between the ears on the lower receiver and it was driving into the knuckle of my middle finger here so i went ahead and took that out got the forward control of design winter guard um very nice trigger guard uh, and it also fills in that block right there the space in between the ears so even with the p22 or if i were to keep the mk machine on there you no longer have the edge of that ear driving into your finger um Oh, also for, for a recoil system, um, like I mentioned, this I did go with a carbine uh, length receiver extension on this build instead of going with an A5 type. Um, I just, I wasn't sure between the gassing, how it was going to work on such a short barrel. Not super familiar with, knowledgeable when it comes to the A5, though I did, did put one on my 13.9. Um, I just decided to stick with a carbine length receiver extension and then I went with a Noveski H3 buffer and a Sprinco Blue buffer spring. So the Sprinco, Sprinco Blue buffer spring is 15% uh, stronger than a standard carbine strength or a carbine length spring. And what that is supposed to do is help dampen the um, recoil because it obviously sh it, it, it can take away the inertia of the bolt carrier group slamming back into the receiver extension. And then also when it's going back forward, it can help with reliability because it's got more strength to drive that BCG home if your gun starts getting really dirty and where maybe you get to a point where the, it, your your bolt wants to hang up, which you can see on this one with the spring coat blue, you cannot get that to hang up. It just drives that BCG home, so. So that is my 12.5 build overall and all the components and why I chose them. Uh, I am super, super happy with this build. Um, when I took it out, I was a bit nervous to see if I was going to have any cycling issues with it because, you know, like I mentioned, I have never installed a barrel. I've never installed a gas block. Uh, I do have a bore scope um, that I use on installation with this. And just double check the gas ports were lined up with each other. I probably studied that gas port from as many different angles that I could for 30 minutes before I tightened down the set screws on the uh, the gas block. And I was very, very happy to see that uh, it, it would run. Um, it was fully dependable. So I think it would be uh, with Criterion barrels. They do advertise that they run well suppressed or unsuppressed. But I'm sure that's also running a, you know full strength ammo, M M193. Um, M855, M262, uh, you might run into some issues um, with cheaper uh, ammo like cheap 223 like Tula or PMC Bronze, uh, like issues that I had with my uh, 13.9 Ballistic Advantage that I put together. Um, so running the uh, Sprinco Blue and the H3 Buffer, um, zero problems, even brand new. Uh, running M193. Really happy with it. Um, I went ahead and tried some some Tula 223 and it wouldn't it wouldn't cycle. Um, it, uh, I think it ejected the empty but didn't even come close to picking up um, the next round. So I have um, some over the other springs. Um, I, I did bring with a standard uh, carbine spring, a Sprinco uh, white, which is just your standard carbine spring. And I did also have a H2 buffer along with a carbine buffer. So brought those with me to the range. Um, first, I tried going down to the uh, H2 weight buffer with the Sprinco blue, the wooden cycle. I was getting bolt over cartridge malfunctions. Um, I went ahead and put in um, the white spring along with uh, the H2 and uh, wouldn't wouldn't function either but when I put in the carbine it would go ahead and cycle um, 223 two, 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 Tula uh, with no problem lock back on an empty magazine uh, rip through some magazines and have any issues whatsoever so super happy that I have the ability obviously I'm, my primary uh, ammo I'm going to run through this is M193 but if I just want to go to the range for some blasting sessions um, 
I can just swap out the uh, buffer spring and go down to a carbine weight uh, buffer and run 223 also. So um, that's it overall. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope maybe, you know, if you're thinking about picking components out for your build itself, um, you know, maybe to help answer some of your questions. Uh, definitely appreciate all the, the views that I've been getting. Um, su subscribers have been growing um, almost every single day. And I, I, I do this to, I love guns, I love gear. Um, getting a lot of feedback from people, um, you know, vast majority of it uh, positive, but, uh, you know, even some of the uh, constructive criticism I receive, uh, I can appreciate that too. So um, hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, any questions you have on anything, please put it in the comments. Um, if you like the video, uh, please hit the like button, share it, and uh, subscribe to my channel, um, recommend it to your friends, whatever it may be. Um, but I know that <laughs> typically I don't go through these tip to butt um gun overviews but it was really happy with this one again i thought it may be able to help some people out uh, the next thing that i have on the books will be a the 18 inch build that i was talking about um got another lmt marzell uh this one here um with the upper is the ford control design ur urf i think it goes together very very well um, I did get all the rest of the components on Black Friday, so that may be the next video that I go with. So, again, thank you to all the views, everybody. Have a good one.